Okay, people. So I have the pleasure of being joined by Jason Miller, the writer and director of Ghosts of the Void. Right. So we looked at this film a few months back and um, yeah, it was great. So I'm glad uh, we've got the chance to talk to uh, Jason, man. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Man, this was a really interesting film really interesting film where did the idea come from <clears throat> well uh, i mean it started really with uh just trying to find a, a concept for a movie that could be shot on a low budget you know um kind of going along with the, the the traditional wisdom of find a location that can be a single location two characters you know try to keep it simple um I was sitting in my car and I thought, well, what if I could make a movie that took place inside a parked car? Um, <laughs> what would that look like? And then the next question was like, well, why would two people be in a parked car? And from there, it's like, well, maybe they were evicted and they're living out of their car. And then at that point, I knew like I had something because I knew that I had a, a story that I could sort of sink my teeth into thematically. Um, that if I was going to be dealing with eviction and poverty and that kind of thing, that there was definitely a horror story to be told in that. Um, so yeah, then I just started writing. I didn't quite know where it was going. I just start, you know, it tends to be how I do it. I just start writing and see what happens. So. Right. Right. Now, um, how long did the process take them with, with the writing of the script? Well, I wrote, I wrote the very, the very first draft of the script that I ever wrote was, was very different it, it had the same setup but it, it kind of took a very different turn it kind of became like a more of a surrealist david lynch kind of thing um and that took like that was really just like a week of me just banging out whatever came into my head um it wasn't that great but it was just the first kind of stab at seeing where that story would go um and then i shelved that and this was this was a while ago this was before um the, the producer of Ghost of the Void, Seth Savoy, um, directed a film a, a couple of years ago called Echo Boomers, which I was also a writer. Um, and this, I wrote that draft before we went into production on that. Um, right. Just to have something in my back pocket, just to have that, that sort of back pocket, low budget script. Mm. Um, but then Echo Boomers happened, and which was a great opportunity. And um, you know, we got to make that movie. I got to be on that set, and that was a lot of fun. Um, got back from that shoot and then COVID hit. And so I was once again, kind of in that position of like, you know what, I, I need that back pocket micro budget script. Um, so at that point I pulled the script back out and really from page one started writing it again, kind of had the idea of like same premise. I'm going to start from the same place, but I'm going to take a different direction this time and see where, see where it goes and see if I went in a more straightforward direction, how would that turn out? And so starting from that point on, it, it, you know, it was a better part of a year of just kind of writing back and forth, trying different things. I mean, at a certain point in, in, in that process, I had given it over to Seth because Seth had asked, you know, after we had finished Echo Boomer, Seth was like, hey, man, let me, you know, what do you what do you got that you want to do? And, you know, shoot it my way and I'll see if I can pull my resources together and get it to happen. Um, so he came on board. And once he came on board, you know, it was a lot of notes and back and forth with the investors and producers to kind of find a movie that we all were happy with um and you know we were writing right up until the minute that we start shooting you know um and even while shooting there's a lot of you know tweaking and changing and stuff going mm. on so i would say the full year it would take about a year but between bringing seth on board uh and production it took us um took us about a year of development, finding money and that kind of thing. And I was writing the whole time, you know, just not, you know, not, not the whole script, but, you know, writing drafts of the script yeah. and tweaks and changes and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important thing though, right? There's, I think sometimes people want to finish, you know, a draft, a script, like really quick, mm -hmm. but the first thing isn't necessarily the best thing. Oh, for sure. Yeah, so it's just looking, going back and forth, seeing what works, what doesn't, giving someone eyes on something, 
you know there's a lot to that but then also you need to it's that understanding okay i we can go this is it i i can't stop yeah. i can't keep meddling with this because it's good it's still good let's go yeah absolutely Mad, but I, I thought it's funny when you were like, oh, I thought I'd go in a more straightforward direction because it's not really straightforward. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's, at some point in the in the in the process of that draft, I started missing some of those sort of surreal elements from the original. And, I, and so I started kind of circling back and, and working some of that stuff back in. Uh, so we kind of ended up somewhere in the middle, I think. Um, you know, it, it became, I think it just kind of became important to me to capture the feeling that I wanted to capture, that the psychology of being overwhelmed with anxiety and, you know, the, uh, the sort of exhaustion and sleep deprivation, that became more interested, interesting to me than just like telling a straightforward like home invasion kind of story. Um, and so I think that's why I started missing those elements. Like when I, when I went full straightforward thriller, it, it just felt like it was missing something. And so that's why I circled back and, and just said, yeah, it's not very straightforward now. Yeah. Um, you know, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like life of pie for adults. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that's, it's, it's really just intriguing because we first um you know we 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 come across our uh, our couple right and you're under the impression that this is you know a happy couple just going through a few issues right they've mm -hmm. hit hard times you know, it's like at the very beginning when, you know, Jen, she feels she snapped and she's like, oh, I'm really sorry for it. And he's just like, yo, that's, come on. If that's snapping, it's nothing, <laughs> right? And you're just like, oh, man, like hard times. We've all been there. But the mm -hmm. more it unfolds, right, the, 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 the deeper we see this goes. And I think yeah. that's really intriguing. I think it really just finds itself perfectly in those moments you know how hard was that that kind of part of it to write have it unfold in a way where you you catch the viewer off and we just mm -hmm. peel back those layers um you know honestly it's a blur <laughs> it's hard to because you know it was there was so there was just so much sort of gradually piece by piece figuring out who these characters were and then and then going back and like you know writing the setup to the payoff that you've just kind of discovered um so it wasn't so much difficult as it was just time consuming and a matter of patience and and finding those little those little beats once I kind of had the the sense of like who Tyler was and what his issues were, um, you know, I started, and this is something that we also talked about with the actors a lot, was kind of figuring out what's really going on in that first act um, versus what it looks like is going on. And so, you know, it, it was it, it was kind of easier to think about Tyler as, you know, having this sort of mental illness that he's, you know, very volatile and, and and almost always ready to snap and that Jen has to sort of like compensate and deal with that um you know it was easy to kind of make that look like love and tenderness when it was actually a certain kind of you know fear and trepidation um, mm. um so yeah you know just kind of knowing what's really going on and versus how they present it that helps in the writing process it gives you kind of a guide to to you know go on but i think the biggest the biggest hurdle there was just trying to figure out how much of it worked on the page and how clear it was because there's there's there so much there that I knew I was going to have to rely heavily on the actors to sort of bring out some of the nuances of that. But, you know, you don't have that on the page when you're pitching and trying to find investors and, and mm. they're reading it. And it's like, 
you know, 40 pages of characters who love each other and then don't all of a sudden, um, you know, it's hard to find that on the page sometimes and communicate that, those nuances. Yeah, because it's like tone of voice, it's use of words, like it mm. really just, man, it works so well. And then, you know, the, the actors you got, man, they killed it. Right, yeah, they, they really did, sure. conveyed those emotions perfectly. You know, what was that casting process like? You know, it's a pretty standard um, process. We we hired a casting agency out of Chicago. Um, they they sent out a casting call to some New York agents and a few Chicago agents and a few New York agents. Um, but it was through the New York agents that we got um, callbacks from Tedra and Michael. And, um, and yeah, they, uh, you know, they were the, they were the best ones for the role. I was looking for some very specific things that they had, you know, with Michael or with Tyler, I was looking for a, that sort of mask, um, darkness that, you know, that ability to kind of have that kindness and gentleness about him. And, you know, to, to get that, I, I just sent on two sides. One was a scene from earlier in the film and then one was a scene from later in the film. And Michael just nailed both. It was just like, he, he was such, he's such a nice guy and such a kind and friendly guy and, and approachable guy. But then he can turn that that darkness on really well. And, and it's, it's very disturbing. Uh, and Tedra the same way. You know, I was looking for somebody who had sort of a quiet strength. You know, she's somebody who has to deal with a very volatile person and has to do so with a certain kind of tenderness and patience. Um, and I wanted to see that, and I wanted to see what it looked like when that broke, and Tedra delivered that too. So yeah, they were right for the roles, and uh, no regrets there for for that that casting choice. Mm. Like, what did you kind of did you do anything to help them build that relationship, you know, or give them reference points for? what you wanted from those characters we just really just talked about who these characters were and um you know what they were going through um i talked a lot about you know with tedra i talked a lot about how she needs to approach tyler um you know because sometimes you know the tendency with some of the dialogue was to play it very aggressive you know that you know she would snap at him or or you know, say something with a little bit of, you know, um, grit to it. And, but it took, you know, that that's kind of the tendency in a lot of the auditions and stuff like that. But the, ten mm. the ability to kind of talk with an actor and say like, you know what, let's try it to where, you know, you're going to approach with a lot more, um, you know, uh, caution here and, and, and try to keep the peace. Um, those little nuances and stuff like that was, was a lot of just kind of what we talked about and really that was it it was just a lot of kind of conversation going up um we had like a half day rehearsal and that was it um but um you know rehearsals are fine but i really just like talking about the characters with the actors i think that for me at least it just does a lot more um because if they can get in that headspace and map out the arcs themselves um then the rehearsals you know Rehearsals then just are a breeze. Yeah. So. Okay. But I think this was your featured directorial debut, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's like, it doesn't look like it's your featured directorial debut, Jason. You Thank know you. what I mean? It, 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 you just think this comes from someone with a seasoned hand because it's dealing with those nuances with just that deft touch to make it seem, you know what I mean? Like it's one mm. thing, right? The way you unfolded the story. So what was it that you felt this was the right time for a feature and the right time for this type of complex feature? Because it's not just two people sitting in a car and talking, right? There's right. so many complexities to it. Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, I, I feel like it's been the right time for a feature for 
you know, over a decade now. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it's just getting to the right one. You know, and I, I had tried on several occasions to get, you know, some bigger projects off the ground that were, you know, too big for a first time director to be trying to, to take on. No one's going to give a first time director millions of dollars to make their first feature. Unless you're Steph making Echo Boomers, but um, but for me it was you know it wasn't that easy. But I kept trying until I finally sort of like stepped back and said, okay, you know what, do the smart thing and write that simple low budget movie that you know every first director has to do. Um, it, it took it took me like ten years too long to figure out that I needed to do that. Um, but you know I also think that just for this story. Um, those 10 years of trying to get a first feature off the ground was a struggle. Um, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of those sleepless nights, there was a lot of, uh, you know, anxiety trying to find work and trying to pay the bills while you pursued your dream. And so those 10 years of struggle really informed what that, that first feature ended up being, you know, it, it I ended up having the story to write based on the experience of trying to find it. Mm. Um, so, um, so yeah, you know, um, it just felt like the right one. It was, it was the right approach to, to finally get that done. Um, and, you know, it, it's, to me, it's just a matter of, of time and patience. You know, you, if you just work on something long enough and dwell on it long enough, you know, you just, you keep adding those layers they, they just kind of naturally start working in and you know I, I tend to kind of approach things from a set it and forget it kind of standpoint in the sense that like once i have an aspect of it that i know works i i sort of like step away from it and let it just let it be like whether it's a metaphor or an image or something like that um and then i'll start building on top of that to the point then that by the time i'm like in the editing process I can't quite remember like what was planned and what was, I, I, I'd, I'd see like some little details that would come up like, Oh, that's really cool. That worked out really nice. That little, this little uh, uh, motif that, that, that kind of happened. And, and like my wife, who's been part of the process for the whole time. I like, yeah, you, you planned that. You wrote that in the script. Like, Oh, I did, didn't I? Yeah. Because, you know, so it's just like a lot of layers that build up over time and you just have to cut it. You can't, I don't think you can think about it all at once. You know, you mm, can't mm. like try to balance it all. You just have to kind of like build a layer, build a layer, build a layer. And, and then, you know, at a certain point when we're shooting, I honestly can't remember why I wanted this set up like this, what the metaphor was or what, you know, that, but I know there was a reason. And so I keep, you know, that makes yeah. sense. You, you, you trust yourself, right? That yeah. these things are there for a reason and it will become clear at some point. Yeah. Right, right. Are you a storyboard type of person, Jason? Uh, yeah, I am. Um, not that it does a lot of good <laughs> when you get on set and you have to, you know, scrap your whole thing. But um, I we definitely planned a lot, especially for this movie, just because, you know, there was so little that well seemingly so little that you can really do with such a limited location and so dp and i were very adamant about finding every possible angle that we could um and sort of mapping out when we would use it when you know when is the camera going to be behind them in the back seat or in front of them and what does each mean when do we employ one or the other um so yeah, we did a lot of storyboarding and a lot of, we have a lot of shot listing. Um, but then we get on set and we realized that we vastly overestimated how quickly we could, you know, run through all this stuff. And so we're kind of on the day, like having to, you know, completely rethink what our plan was, but, you know, going in with the plan, you, you already know kind of what, what you need to get to. So yeah. it's, easier to kind of work out a whole new blocking system than you have that as a foundation so um definitely a planner yeah for sure okay <laughs> how was the outside shots 
you know, doing it in the woods and that was, was that oh, difficult? Very difficult. We shot in November oh. um, in a Chicago sub suburb, so it was freezing cold. Um, that parking lot had no natural light. There was no street light, nothing. And so it had to kind of, we had to build the entire lighting setup and they had to do it every night, night after night, because we, we were in a, it was a school parking lot. And uh, so there were, there were kids that were on campus until like 6 PM and, you know, by 6 30 in November in Chicago, it's pure, it's pitch black. And so we couldn't even get on set and start setting up until it was already dark. And that was that was a huge and you know that involved moving a condor around and, and like all sorts of like just just chaos um we had a very small crew and they were great they were excellent but there's only so much small crew can do in the pitch black <laughs> cold and so yeah you know, night after night was a very very difficult challenging thing and you know it'd be wet muddy and so yeah yeah it was really tough oh boy <laughs> that sounds rough, man. It definitely does. <laughs> yeah. Like, does something like a night shoot in the winter, does that add to the insurance? Um, I think so, yeah. Um, you know, it's... Uh, I, I think it certainly comes across in the performances, you know, of just how, you know how much uh, tension there is there because, you know, they're physically feeling the tension of being in the freezing cold. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you know, it, it, it's tough, but it, but it, it, it you know, it's, it's part of the process is mm. how it has to be sometimes, you know. <laughs> oh man. But yeah, no, it, it really, it really works so well, you know, with the, uh, like with the shoe, how long did you have to be able to, you know, do all of this? Like what kind of time constraints were you working with? Um, well, totally we, we shot for 19 days and we shot 10 hours a day, um, which is not a lot. Um, but, um, we, we kind of made a decision early on that we wanted to do 10 hour days, uh, for a variety of reasons. One is just, we knew the misery of it. Uh, but this was in 2021, right? We started shooting right after the IOPSI strike had almost happened. Um, right. It, it didn't happen, but it was very close. And so it was a very much at the forefront of everybody's mind was, you know, set like, running at running trying to run a set that was not just a complete disaster um, and we knew that just more than 10 hours out in this freezing cold is just going to be too much so mm -hmm. we decided on 10 hours but then that really cut into what we were able to do because you know that's 10 hours to set up all the lights night after night again and again take them all down you know we would probably get maybe six seven hours of like solid shooting time um if i'm being generous you know it was just it was just that tough so um yeah you know it was it was time crunch a lot of time crunch for sure right boy how much changed in the editing process or did anything change the editing process not too much um, you know, there were some scenes rearranged and, and stuff like that, but in the editing, it, it pretty much kind of fell fell into place as we shot it. Now, in the shooting process, there was a lot of, you know, as I've said, there's a lot of changes there, um, just in terms of like rethinking how a scene played out because you had to rethink the blocking and stuff like that. And, you know, we lost a few days of shooting um, due to some unforeseen problem we a location fell through oh. um so we i had to like we had a location for the flashbacks that fell through and i had to scrap like half of those flashback scenes um and figure out like okay what things do i need to have to tell their story enough to get it across mm. what can we do without 
Um, so that was on the day figuring that out. Um, in some cases, we were able to like salvage certain details from the deleted scenes and work them into the dialogue of the scenes that we were able to shoot. But for the most part, it was like a very tough decision to kind of pick from this many scenes, kind of find this many scenes that conveyed the, the story enough to make the movie coherent um, to some degree. Oh. Um, so yeah, a lot changed in that process. But like once we got to the editing process, we knew what we had and what we could do. And so not a lot changed from from in that sense. Right, right. With the um the location that you lost and everything, because you know, watching it, the flashbacks are perfect, right? In how much detail we're given. And mm you know, we, we see how that relationship was. We see what went down outside, just all of those bits. It felt like just the right amount, right? Not mm. too much to give too much away too early or make it really conclusive of situations. So what did you actually, what were you hoping to have shot? Do you remember? Yeah, a lot of it kind of, uh, there was a little bit more detail about, um their debt situation and there's a little bit more uh, examples of tyler sort of abusive toxicity um and i think that had we shot some of that stuff we probably would have ended up cutting a lot of it because you know there's, there's a lot of flashbacks in the movie and i think more than we have would have been too much um but i do think that there some of the like little snippet flashbacks where it's just like a little flash to, you know, a, a shot and then back. Mm. Um, those might have been swapped out for some more overt kind of stuff. Um, right. Just to just kind of hint more at the toxicity of the relationship. As it was, you know, the the best we had was we had this, this scene of, of Tyler passed out of his computer with the bloody hand. And so it was like, that's really the only thing we have to indicate his sort of mental health decline. So we just kept cutting back to that. Um, but it worked. It actually ended up kind of, I think, working as sort of um, a suspense building mechanism in that, you know, if we keep cutting back to this one shot and kind of keep showing a little bit more of it, a little bit more of it, and then finally reveal kind of what the story is behind that. Um, that was something that we kind of found in the edit. Um, Cause otherwise, yeah, it would have been a very, I hope it would have been a lot of different scenes of different things happening. Mm. Um, and, you know, it was, it was tough. Cause like when the film was finished and, and I looked at it, you know, one of my concerns I think was, do we have enough of the toxicity that Tyler has to warrant, you know, well, I, I guess I'm in a spoiler territory here. I guess we can give a spoiler warning for for the listeners. But like, um, do do I have enough toxicity to justify and warrant the direction the story ultimately goes, or is it too you know is it too soft and and now it just looks like a completely uncalled for you know thing unearned? Um, I was concerned about that. But I've been pleasantly surprised with the response so far. You know, I, I, I've read a lot of reviews and stuff of people really just like hating Tyler and didn't really kind of feeling that toxicity and, and the grossness of it. So it worked out, I feel like, you know, it, it, we, yeah. I didn't need those things as much as I thought I did. So. No, I, I think it was well balanced, right? Because I think too much and you're just then wondering, why is she with him? Right. Sure. Why is she staying? So just see the, the amount of stuff that you showed, like with the talking about the oh, I love the first draft, like that scene was great, mm -hmm. you know, and then he's like, I've deleted it and that bit. And, you know, so we see those instances. So I think you planted enough breadcrumbs for people to see this escalation right see when she's talking to her mom be like well I, I need to stay because of this and so we saw enough right to warrant why someone would be in a car with this person 
Right. Because otherwise, you'd be like, what? I mean, that's the time to jettison, right? Like, at this yeah. point, like you could escape. So it's just like, why are they there? So I think what yeah. you had just seemed like it's the perfect amount. But, yeah, and I didn't want it to be so toxic that it was exhausting to watch, too, you know? Um, and I think about the movie, like uh, the movie Possession with Sam Neill, which is, which is a great movie, but holy crap, it's just like, <laughs> it wears you down. And I didn't yeah. want that kind of energy for this movie. I wanted it to be a toxicity that crept in slowly. Um, but yeah, you know, there was a moment when I thought I'd crept it in too slowly and too subtly. Um, but I'm happy with it now. I'm happy with, you know, the response has given me some confidence in it. So, mm. Yeah, it, it kind of reminded me a bit of Memento, right? Because yeah. when you first watch it, you think, ah, oh, poor, poor guy Pierce. And then by then you're like, you're a piece of shit, man. Like, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Like, how did you decide on the... The, the soundtrack because it's very oppressive right and and it works really well but you're just like god damn <laughs> uh well we had a you know i, I had a great uh, composer in, in Devin delaney um we actually pre-scored the movie um well we didn't pre-score the movie but he he wrote some original score for us before we started editing right. so we didn't have to use any temp tracks which was great. It was nice to just like, I hate using temp music because you're going to get married to something and mm. the scene's going to work for a piece of music that you can't use. And But with, with all of the original tracks, we didn't have to do that. Now he went back and we ended up reworking a lot of it um, for the final thing. Um, but yeah, at a certain point, we kind of had this idea of working in this sort of Americana kind of sound. Um, so there's a lot of use of like banjos and things like that, that kind of these little plucks and stuff that uh, you know, kind of work, kind of create this sort of jarring, like warped version of Americana. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just really like what he did there. And um, and then there's a sound team all all together. Uh, guys over at Noise Floor just did such a great job at, you know, creating such a, you know, rich and detailed you know thing yeah it's, it's in the details and I, I i love sound i'm i'm really big on sound and you know it's things like you know the car you know the way they would move in the seats and and mm. creaks and the springs and all the stuff you know i knew that that had to be a character in the movie it had to you know i wanted to hear how poor it was and you know so yeah it's you know, they were just good at what they do. So um, <laughs> it kind of it came together. Yeah. I mean, was there like, again, was there like reference points that you gave, you know, thinking of other films and like, oh, I, I'm kind of looking for something like this or, you know, how did you work things out? Um, with the music initially, uh, yeah, you know, I gave them a couple of, of examples of sort of a, uh, some stuff that that I liked that was very atmospheric, which is really what I, I kind of wanted from from the score was atmospheric sound. So, um, you know, we looked at at stuff like uh, Annihilation and um, the score for uh, Under the Skin, um, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that that was kind of a starting point. We slowly kind of discovered our own thing. Um, um, so, so yeah. Awesome. Now, going into this, what did you kind of envision to be the, the most difficult thing, right? The thing that might cause you the most issues. And at the end, was that the case or was it something else? Um, <clears throat> I think that the thing I was most nervous about going in was not the actors themselves, but me working with the actors. Right. Um, my my actors director kind of thing. It's the it's. I think that's one thing that most directors are kind of self conscious about. Um, cause it's 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 nice to be an actors director, but so many of us don't feel like we are. And 
you know, I, I, I never worked with SAG actors either. Um, so this was this that was a first. Well, I had worked with one SAG actor once a long time ago for a short film, but for the most part, you know, this was my first time working with with actors of this caliber. Um, which you know, I mean, you know, Jen Ty or uh, Michael and Tedra, they're not, you know, they're not stars yet, um, but they'd been in some things, and so they they had the experience. And here I'm coming along, you know, thinking like, oh man, you know, I think I ended up in the end sort of over preparing for that because I was so nervous about it that I was just like I was rereading all the books and all the stuff pulling out all the stuff from film school to like just to refresh my memory of how you know how to best approach this and by then then I actually started talking to them and it was just a breeze it was great they were fantastic I felt like we hit it off and so I don't know if I I don't know if my over preparation like paid off or if I never really had to worry about it in the first place. Um, but I have told people like the easiest part of this shoot was the actors because Michael and Tedger were just so great and they, you know, they didn't need a lot. They just, we just needed to talk about the characters and they got it and they, they made it happen. Um, so yeah, that was the thing I was most nervous about. And it was the thing that I think worked out the best in the whole thing that, really makes the movie I think when 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 things were really tough and I was scrapping those shots and, and rethinking some of the act actions that I, I wanted to happen I just it, it gets it gets really discouraging at, at a point but then I kind of look at what Michael and Tedra are doing and I'm thinking if nothing else I've got a movie with two strong actors who are delivering some great performances mm. so that kind of kept me going um, during the hard times for sure yeah, it's, it's, I mean, everything works. Like, everything works. It's great, man. Like, what's the reception been like? Um, it's, it's been good. Uh, you know, it, it was a little tough at first. Um, we actually, the movie was originally called The Lot. That was the original title. And we started shopping it around um, film festivals um, under that title. And it's just, we weren't getting bites. It just, at the same time, we didn't have a trailer. We didn't have a poster. We didn't have any marketing behind it at all. We were just trying to put it out there and hoping people would, would take the bait and, and, and give it a watch. And we just weren't getting the response we wanted from it. So we decided to regroup. We started kind of putting our marketing materials together. Um, one of our producers suggested a title change. And so we started kind of exploring that option. Um, and we regrouped and we, started again and we started getting those bites um we got into popcorn frights which was one of i think the best things that happened for the movie was playing virtually there um so that's a really great genre festival and because we were virtual we were basically accessible to anybody in the u.s mm. and so from that point we started actually getting reviews we started you know we got up on letterboxd and people started actually giving their their thoughts um so so that was great i and i found it to be polarizing in a lot of ways which i kind of always figured it would be and and i'm okay with that i, I I'm, I'm proud of that i think that's that's a good thing um and but i i like the I, it's it's been nice seeing the the nice reviews the, the reviews from people that really get what the movie's going for and appreciate it um that's been very encouraging and um really really great um so yeah it's uh that part's been good um i don't see much of the negativity because i i choose not to click on the <laughs> the two star reviews and stuff like that uh, maybe i will later but right now I, I don't need that in my head um so so i don't know what the uh i could i could guess though you know like i know what i i want to do better next time and stuff like that so i don't you know whatever the criticisms are whatever but but the but the good reviews have been saying all the things that i had hoped they would say and 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 seeing the points of it that i i always hoped that people would see in it so that's been really encouraging and then we got distro and you know we're coming out so it's, it's nice. finally happening so mm. Yeah, because I think it was August when I originally looked at this. Mm. So it is, it's been a while, you know, and it, I think with things like this, you always wonder, you know, because you watch great films, but you just 
think like, ah, oh, when's it gonna, you know, drop mm. for everyone to see? So, you know, it's nice to know that you you've got that date, and that that's great. But uh, you know, finishing your first film, right? So, how much has that set you up? to go forwards. I know you've got another film in the works, right? So, uh, you know, yeah, I got a couple, um, I got a couple irons in the fire at least. Um, I've optioned another, another script with Seth's company that's the cosmic horror, um, much bigger. We're, we're, we're ready to kind of step up to the next, to the next level, um, budget wise. Um, but I also have another film, one of one of those earlier films that I mentioned trying to get off the ground. Mm. That you know, one of those is still out there, kind of floating around, getting some interest. So you know, my next movie could be one of those two, or it might be something else entirely. It might be it might be that we need to make another low budget one before we jump up to the next level. Uh, in which case, you know, I'm I'm working on a script now that I think could be great for that. Um, so I'm always just working on something and putting irons on fire. But hopefully, yeah, I mean, hopefully, if that was the goal, right? The goal is just to get that over the hurdle of that first feature. Um, if nothing else, I can finally say that I've directed a feature film and it's out in the world. People can see it. Um, that feels that feels really good. Um, as to whether or not it's going to open the doors to the next one, I hope so, but we'll see. Mm. Well, I mean, I, th I think you can tell people that you directed a great feature film, mm -hmm. an award-winning feature film, Jason. Do you know what I mean? It, it's not yeah. just a, a little dibby old film. Like, you killed it <laughs> with this, man. So you can hold Thank your you. head up high when talking about ghosts, man. You know? Yeah. Thank you. I had no worries, man. It, no, it was it was great to um watch it. And hopefully, Jason, you will be happy enough to come back and talk about you know your future projects because yeah, that for sure. Be awesome. Now, how can people keep track of what you're doing? Like, where can they find you? Um, I'm I'm on uh I'm on all the the social media sites. The, I'm on Instagram and and Twitter or whatever whatever they're calling it now. Um. <laughs> I, I'm on Blue Sky, which is where I, I was like hoping things would start to transition over. Um, but you know, people 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 keep clinging to Twitter. So, you know. <laughs> for for now for now I'm in those places, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okie dokie. All right. Well, people, make sure you go follow Jason because Ghost in the Void is a fantastic film. You know, uh, like what genre would you say this is? Just calling it like horror drama or a thriller drama, something like that. Right, right. So if that is your sort of thing, you need to go watch it. And are you open to all genres, Jason? Or is there certain um, ones you like playing in the most? I mean, horror is kind of where I where I really love to be. But I I, I definitely see myself branching out into other things. I think I'm always probably going to circle around more darker macabre kind of themes. Um, I don't see myself going like full comedy or anything like that. But um, yeah, you know. Okay. Well, Jason, let's try and keep it a little bit light because, man, I have to watch horror films during the day. Like, it's too <laughs> creepy to watch certain shit at night, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> No, but this was great, and I really appreciate getting the time to talk to you about the film, man. So I, I, I'm glad everything is going well. I'm glad it's about to drop, and I hope you're enjoying the success that's coming your way. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you very much. People, go check out Ghost in the Void and go follow Jason. All right. Peace. All right. Thank you.